Okay, seeing as we've got a few people here, we will, we will get cracking. This is me, Lorna Reeves, and uh, I'm the founder of My Oh My Weddings. And this is the second of our series of Facebook Lives. Um, I'm extremely passionate about giving back to the LGBT community. And what I want to do is get a collective of people who each have a slightly different story and are prepared to tell that story. And hopefully it resonates with somebody out there. Um, and if it resonates with one person, then we've done our job. Uh, and today I have the wonderful, <laughs> awe-inspiring and award-winning Emma Millet McCaffrey, and I have to say that very carefully, um, who is the Community Engagement Manager yes. for Diversity Role Models. And those of you that have been around my and my for a while know that we are partnered with the amazing charity that is Diversity Role Models, and I'll let Emma explain what they do um, in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm going to run through some questions um, and find out a little bit more about Emma. Um, I've got a couple of questions queued up um, that people have asked as well. And <laughs> yeah, no pressure. And if anybody's got anything they want to ask, um, drop it in the comments section. Um, and as we go along, if there's stuff that you really like, give us some thumbs up. If there's something that's controversial, let us know um, with various emojis and things. Um, it helps me know that I'm giving you the good stuff. <laughs> okay, let's get cracking. So, <laughs> tell us about you. When did you first know that there was something different? Um, I knew kind of early secondary school um, and I actually asked one of my close friends to go out with me. It lasted about a week and a half, <laughs> as things do at that age. Um, she ended it and for her it didn't feel right, it didn't feel natural or anything like that. But for me something did, I just wasn't quite sure what. So around the age of about 14, I came out to my friends as bisexual mm -hmm. because as far as I was concerned, I still thought I had an interest in boys, but I obviously also had some kind of attraction to girls, but wasn't quite sure what that was. Um, and so I came out at that age, um, faced quite a bit of bullying, torment, didn't really know how to deal with it. And at that time, Section 28 was in place. And Section 28, for those who don't know, was a piece of legal legislation that meant that homosexuality could not be promoted in schools. Um, and so throughout my whole school life, Section 28 was in place, which meant that LGBT wasn't discussed, it wasn't a thing. And obviously growing up in the, the 80s and 90s, I didn't even see any real representation of certainly not females who were attracted to other females. Yeah. Um, so didn't really know what it was that I was experiencing, had no points of reference. Um, struggled with it, struggled with not knowing where I fitted in the world. Um, also struggled with religion, mm -hmm. growing up in a religious household, my mum being a Christian, the, the people around me very much at that time, my circle of friends being from a Christian faith. Um, and so I, I did struggle, my mental health impacted, um, kind of trigger warning I suppose, I did self-harm um, and I did attempt to take my own life because I just didn't know where I fitted in the world. Wow. Um, I then went off to university thinking I was going to become this free spirit and find myself and dated the boy next door, <laughs> dated the boy next door for five years. Um, and it was only when I was in my first full-time job coming out of, of university and doing a PGCE that I kind of re-engaged with this whole conversation with myself about who I was and where I should be um, and ended up coming to the conclusion that I actually didn't fancy him. I was with him for the relationship and the companionship but there was no connection yeah. as there should be in a relationship. Um, and so had the hardest conversation with anybody, told him I was gay and not attracted to him. Ooh, that's a tough one. Shattered his world. Um, but from that point my, on, knew I needed to be not only honest with him, but more importantly, honest with me and myself and everybody around me. So from that point onwards, I 
promised myself I would never lie to anybody about who I was. Mm -hmm. um, so in reality, kind of early 20s was my full blown coming out, this is me moment. Love it. Never going back in the closet, never pretending I'm anything I'm not and just embracing who I was as a person. And did knowing that you were different but having no role models, did that affect how you did at school, your education, or did you still um, manage to get where you needed to be? Yeah, I, I did okay. Um, I mean, I'd always been a C grade student, so I got two Bs, seven Cs and a D. Um, Middle of the road and steady. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's all you need. Um, and I was a performer. So that's where my heart lied. Mm -hmm. So I was in all the amdram and the dancing and the singing and everything else in school. Um, and that's where my university took me and I got a 2-1 from that. Um, but I think at, at some point in, in my schooling, kind of very much after I'd, I'd um, tried to take my own life, I kind of just thought, forget about the relationship stuff, forget about anything to do with who I am, just focus on my education and getting out of where I was yeah. and physically moving away mm. from home, getting out of that scenario in an attempt to find myself and somewhere else. Escape. Yeah. Brilliant. Well done you. <laughs> well done you. And how were family? Um, Either when you were growing up or when you officially decided to... To come out. When I came out as a teen, um, my mum actually worked in school, in the school office as an admin support. In your school? In my school. Mm -hmm. um, so she had picked up that things weren't great, but wasn't sure why. Um, and it was actually only when I um, tried to take my own life, I actually informed somebody else at the time that I was doing it who happened to be church related, who then also had a duty of care. And that duty of care led them to tell my parents. So my mum and dad waited for me at school um, and then collected me and took me to hospital yeah. and to A&E. Um, and it was then the following morning, having been in overnight for observation, where I had to speak to a child psychiatrist and do that with my parents in the room because of the age that I was at the time. Yeah. And it was the first time they'd really heard me say I was being bullied and the reason why. And my mum's immediate response was, it's just a phase you'll grow out of it. Wow, that's hard. Um, and then when I came out in my 20s, I think she thought it had been a phase because obviously I'd been in a relationship with a yeah. guy. Um, and when I did come out kind of for that second time, um, she struggled still having her faith and how could she have her faith and a gay daughter. And um, I personally didn't find members of the church very supportive at the time. There were very few. Um, and it was kind of a, can't you see what you're doing to your family? Can't you see what you're doing to your mum? Rather than being a strength of support for me. Um, however, over time, we have re rebuilt our relationship and actually at my wedding my mum stood up on the microphone and apologised for saying it was just a phase and apologised for how she treated me realising that this is just who I am. That's huge. Yeah. Wow. Well done mum. <laughs> well done. And well yeah. done you for educating her <laughs> along the way. And I think, and I, I, I've written an article on the power of of allies but also us supporting our allies and I think that's something that I didn't realise while I was in it at the time is that the barriers came down and it was well if you're not going to accept me that's fine I can live without you I don't have to have you in my life rah 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 when actually I needed to take the time and she needed to take the time to actually listen to each other and learn from each other and for me to help her become an ally if it help her understand how I see the world differently to how she sees the world and only from that can she get it mm -hmm. and now is somebody that other people who are Christian and have LGBT children go to to ask questions if they're unsure. Oh, well done. <laughs> I'm a long way. Yes. <laughs> and so when you came out and you made that promise to yourself to live authentically, you obviously were looking for work and you started your career path. 
tell us a bit about your career <laughs> journey. <laughs> it's been a wild one. It's been an interesting one for sure. And, and has your sexuality impacted on your career, either positively or negatively? So, started off, did a PGCE. Um, and went into teaching as a drama teacher. Of course. No stereotypes there. Um, so I started off as a drama teacher. Um, drama taught for about nine years. Um, and part way through that was when I came out for the second time. Um, and I actually, not only did I come out in my personal life, but I also came out in my work life. So I was very much pushing for my school to become more inclusive and to sign up to various things anyway um, and one of the things we signed up to got an assembly um, with a lovely guy who I'm now pleased to call a friend um, who at the time was Lance Corporal James Wharton he's now out of the army so it's just James um, and he was um, the first person to be in a same-sex marriage within the household cavalry mm -hmm. so he came and he delivered an assembly to uh, my whole school and obviously talked about being in the army and being gay. And at the end of the assembly, I also came out in front of the whole school. Brilliant. And was kind of like, you know, if you need support when James is gone, you've still got me. Um, and so then made sure that there was always signposting. People always knew in the school they could come to me if they needed help, if they needed support. Um, and still to this day have several ex-pupils of mine who are now in their 20s and therefore make me feel old and some of them are even now parents makes me feel even older um who still in touch with me who still tell me what a difference it made just me being visible to them mm -hmm. um i very much hold dear a letter that was left for me by one of my ex-pupils that basically said when i joined the school in year nine someone told me you'd come out in assembly and i suddenly knew i had somewhere to go and i wasn't on my own and she's now engaged to her girlfriend Brilliant. so that's amazing yeah really made a difference and I do think at that somewhere where my sexuality did have an impact on my job because that became more of a focus for me and I tried to deliver in-house inclusion training with a friend of mine who was an ally um, to kind of make the other staff aware of how they could be inclusive in what they were doing in the classroom and it not necessarily have to always be reliant on having a gay lesson. Mm -hmm. um, that job then um, ended quite abruptly. Um, I'm going to call it a, a differences between myself and the head. Diplomatic. Um, yeah. I then did a bit of supply teaching um, at the time was in North Yorkshire and then moved over to, to Liverpool. So did some supplying in the Northwest. Um, wanted, I, I loved being in the classroom, I loved being with the young people, but for me, teaching had then gone as a, as a career for me. Mm -hmm. So looking to alternatives and very much wanted to go into the LGBT space somehow. Um, ended up getting a job with Broken Rainbow that was, mm -hmm. which used to be the um, UK's only LGBT domestic abuse charity. Um, Worked for them for about six, seven months, delivering and developing training mm -hmm. um, until the uh, then CEO decided to bankrupt the charity and run off. And we'll leave that one at that. Mm -hmm. That can be picked up in many a Patrick Strudwick article <laughs> on Pink News <laughs> and BuzzFeed and everywhere else. Um, but I had already started um, working with Greater Manchester Police at the time to help support them um, with delivering some training. So I then worked with them on an independent basis, um, delivering LGBT awareness and domestic abuse training to all of their frontline staff. So I trained over 2,000 um, frontline police officers at Greater Manchester Police, um, culminating in them all having had the training and meaning that they now separately code and record same-sex domestic abuse separate from heterosexual domestic abuse which means they're the only police force in the whole country that has it recorded separately so they have firm statistical information of what is happening in greater manchester as an area so we have firm statistical information that we can share with the government with other people to say this does happen in our relationships yeah. and in the greater manchester area 
this is where it where it happens more. Mm -hmm. This is the time of year where it happens more. This is the types of ways that it happens, and also where people are then signposted to for support and, and whether things go through to magistrates, courts, or yeah. whatever. That's amazing. So was did that. Um, then got a job working for mermaids, um, who are a close friend of, of diversity role models in that they support young people and their families who are trans and gender non-conforming. So work with them for a short period of time, again working to develop and pull together um, some training specifically for schools and a government funded project. But came to a time where um, I, in my personal life, was looking to embark upon IVF. Um, and so decided to take a step back because I couldn't be delivering training all over the country and trying to be at clinical appointments at the same time. Yeah. Um, and then after, well, a kind of eight month period within that, um, then was looking to keep myself occupied because I can't sit on my hands for long <laughs> and I was bored stiff. Um, and having volunteered for DRM for four and a half years by that point, um, and was fortunate enough that the then CEO, Claire Harvey, is also a very, very good friend of mine. She kind of knew I was sat around doing nothing. There were extra hands needed in the office. Um, so she sort of said, why don't you come in the office and, and do some volunteering? And then I landed myself a job as community engagement manager. Nice. And I'm here. <laughs> Brilliant. What a whirlwind. Yeah. And nothing not, simple with me. <laughs> and you've had so much impact all over the country and all over the LGBT community. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty you. amazing. So um, for those people that don't know about DRM, what is their ethos? What are they trying to achieve? So Diversity Role Models is all about trying to create a more inclusive environment, particularly in schools for young people and for a better future. Um, so our work consists of both primary and secondary school input. In primary schools, we focus on celebrating different families and the fact that it doesn't matter whether you have one mum, two dads, gran lives at home with you, you've been fostered, whatever it looks like at home, as long as you have food, love and water, that's what really matters. And in secondary school, the focus is a lot more around breaking down of stereotypes, around use of language, um, whether that is a intended impact or more often than not unintended impact. Um, and in both settings, we take volunteers like yourself <laughs> um, into the classroom to share their own personal stories. So often in the primary school, they are a same sex parent themselves or they are uh, someone who has a close positive relationship with a young person. So for the moment I've been in the classroom and I've been talking about the relationship I have with my best mate's son and the fact that Harry doesn't care who it is he is waking up with me at 5 a.m. in the morning, mm -hmm. as long as it means we're waking up and we're having fun and we're doing something. Um, and in secondary school, the volunteers are often um, LGBT and allies who share something of either their coming out story or if they're an ally, why they're an ally and what that means to them and why it's so important for them. Because often in the classroom, we may be speaking to the odd one or two who are going to join the seven or eight percent of us in the rainbow world. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, we're talking to the majority of kids in that classroom who we want to grow up to be the allies, to be the support and not the ones that are being negative towards others for being different because we're all different. And some people would say, and this is going to be a bit controversial, <laughs> that by teenage years, the kids are already impacted by their, by their religion, by their home life, by their parents' views. Does it really have an impact? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm rubbish with numbers, but by the end of a DRM workshop and from the, the last school year, we've had 89% of young people by the end of an hour long workshop or a 40 minute workshop will say that they now feel that they will stand up and befriend and challenge homophobic, biphobic and transphobic language if they hear it being used inappropriately. So it does have an impact. Um, and sometimes it's about challenging those things that they've learned so far because they may not have ever heard a difference of opinion from mm -hmm. that. Um, for example, you mentioned religion. We, um, as part of LGBT History Month last month, launched our faith and sexuality orientated workshop. So we have our usual workshops that mm -hmm. you have yourself been a part of, but we now also have 
an additional workshop that if a school wants us to come in and specifically talk about faith and sexuality, we can do that and we take our faith role models of faith with us. So we will take Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, you know, the whole remit for the school's requirement and, and who they want. So in some respects, if we've worked with a, a Jewish school in, in Liverpool in the regions, if they want a workshop where they have Jewish role models, we can now provide that for them. Fantastic. Fantastic. And what would you say, this is my last question before we <laughs> move into the quick fire round, um, if somebody has someone either at work or is new to their friendship group and knows that they are in the LGBT community, I can't even say it today, <laughs> LGBT community and they don't know what to call them, how to refer to them, they might be going through a transition, how should or what, what would be an idea of how they could approach somebody so it's not awkward because people are just terrified of saying the wrong thing and yeah. putting their foot in it. I think the best thing to do is simply ask. Um, ask and then hear, not necessarily just listen, but hear what is being said in return. Um, because it's all about personal identity. Um, you know, I am a gay woman, I'm not a lesbian, and my wife isn't anything, she doesn't label herself as anything, and yet walking down the street we will be referred to as a pair of lesbians, neither of which we are. Yep. So it's about asking the individual how they want to be identified and then simply accepting that, no questions asked, and moving forward like that. Straightforward. Yep. That's what we like. Okay, quick fire questions, uh -oh. and a couple from, <laughs> from the audience. Ready? <laughs> and if you've got any questions, add them on in the comments. I'll pick them up um, as we go along. But first one, favorite movie? Uh, probably not favourite movie necessarily, but my favourite go-to for a cry mm -hmm. would be Four Weddings and a Funeral. Classic. The uh, Stop All the Clocks Funeral, every time, bawling, blubbing like a baby, <laughs> can recite it whilst blubbing. So yeah, not necessarily favourite of all time, but definitely my go-to. Good choice. And favourite song? Uh, regularly changes but song of the moment has to be this is me <laughs> um and i recently learned sign language so i'm trying to learn it in sign as well wow and you know any of it in sign this is me i think we like it i might we be like wrong I might if be anyone wrong. can sign feel free to put a correction video. i'm gonna get told off now <laughs> <laughs> you've got to practice it got to practice it and last one cats or dogs Oh, and now this is another hard one because we have <laughs> we have two office dogs in the office. Mm -hmm. Will, our head of ops, has Max and Delta, and they are job share heads of morale. However, I would say cats because we have a cat at home, and Shane would not speak to me anymore if I didn't say cats. So, good one. Yeah. All right, we'll let you hedge your bets. <laughs> um, so we've got a question um, in the group. What can parents or carers do at home to support the young children the way that you do in schools? Ooh, I think having open conversations um, and also, I suppose, in some respects, being aware of our own biases and how that can possibly be influence, influential on our own children. I don't have any children of my own at the moment, but just being aware that you may have your own view, but allowing your children the chance to formulate their own. So having conversations, open conversations with them, where you will obviously share your own views, but allowing them to question those. Um, and also accessing, there are, believe it or not, some really good YouTube channels out there, reading inclusive literature, um, depending on the age of your children. Um, young primary age children we use a book called Antango Makes Three Love in the classroom book. all about two gay male penguins who bring up a chick of their own so it's really nice to have a conversation at a really young age um, and then going up for example there's a, a one of my favorite books that's great read to understand trans and non-gender conforming is a book called um, oh no it's just gone out of my head The Art of Being Normal mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic book, brilliant book, and it's definitely one for teens. Um, so I think making sure you've got inclusive literature as well as having those open conversations. You know, if if uh, gay characters come up on the TV, having a discussion with them, you know, what's your opinion on? And most of the time you would say they'll be like, well, who cares? Or, oh, such and such at school is 
non-binary or gay or bi or pan or whatever um, and a lot of the time for some young people it's just not a thing mm -hmm. which is great but we also have to be aware that for some people it is still an issue and still having those conversations and not sitting back thinking the future's got it because they haven't and we'll drop some um, resources in the comments after the session as well just different websites and yeah a couple of the links to the books um, and if you've got anything you want to follow up on i'm sure emma will pick those up in the comments as well yeah fab uh, next question then um if you had to go back and do it all again what would you do differently oh my goodness nothing Ooh. because the journey I've been on has made me who I am sat here today and if I went back and changed something I might not be who I am today um, and I very much I feel like I've taken ownership of my past and of things that have happened to me because I'm covered in ink but all of my ink is my narrative Mm -hmm. Every single one of my tattoos tells a story from the very first one I had, which is of me and the guy I was with, all the way through to my most recent with my poppy and my rainbow poppy to represent the fact that myself and, and Anne, who is my wife and in the Royal Navy, are part of the Royal British Legion's first ever LGBT branch and we're founder members. So every single one is my narrative and is my past and is my history which has made me who I am today so nothing and if you could give a young person one piece of advice <laughs> what would it be um oh that's a really hard one one piece of advice trust in you interesting trust in you that you know what is right for you, you know who you are in the world and trust that everything else will come together around you. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but at some point you will find your fit and your place in the world. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Thank you. That's all of our questions. <laughs> you can step out of the hot seat or the comfy sofa as it is today, the comfy sofa under the wonderful rainbow. <laughs> I can see my fantastic regional coordinator, Kate, has posted a link to uh, our website. So Brilliant. feel free to jump on there and there are links to resources and stuff. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much um, for joining us. I will put this up as a permanent link on my own page and I'll drop it into the My oh My page. And I'm sure it will make its way over to Emma's page at some <laughs> point as well. Uh, if you've got any questions, do drop them into the comments box and we'll follow them up. Um, and I'll make sure they're directed to the right source. Um, thank you for finding out more. Thank you for questioning. Um, and thank you for all of your support. And if you think this <laughs> video might be helpful to anyone, please do share it and um, share it far and wide. Because um, you never know what people are sitting on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for thank doing you. this with me. <laughs> uh, and it was great to see you all. Um, have a great evening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>